I will introduce uh, Professor Suchopless uh, in a few words and then uh, leave you time enough to make your point and then uh, for us to have some time for the discussion. So, um, well, uh, Dr. Uh, Jaroslav Suchopless uh, holds a, um, an MA in history from the University of Gdańsk. Uh, following doctorate studies here in uh, 2000, he defended his PhD thesis at the Department of History of the University of Helsinki in Finland. His doctoral advisor was Matti Klinger, and he has been studying also at the University of California, Berkeley, in 2001-2002. Between 2000 and 2002, he was working as an analyst at the Polish Institute of International Affairs, Polski Institut Spraw Międzynarodowy, PISM. He uh, was a lecturer at the Humboldt University in Berlin in 2003-2004, at the Free University of Berlin uh, in 2005, and at the University of Wrocław in the same period, and at the University of Bonn and Mazure in Olsztyn 2007-2008, and later uh, at our University of Szczecin uh, from 2008-2013, to 2013. Uh, between 2013 and 2015, he was associate professor of uh, European Studies uh, at the National University of Malaysia, which brought him uh, pretty far from Europe and changed maybe some of his perspective on also European issues. Uh, he also had several articles on Finland, Baltic Sea region, history of World War One and World War Two. Uh, for example, uh, in 2007, Finland, 1917-1918, uh, in the documents of the U.S. Department of State, uh, or uh, also uh, previously to this, Finland and the United States, 1917-1919, the early years of mutual relations. What I would like to add as a last information uh, is that from uh, September 2017 to uh, March uh, 2019, uh, Mr. Jarosław Suchoples was representing Poland um, as an, ambas an ambassador to uh, Finland, uh, which is uh, noteworthy, of course. So, uh, please, uh, Mr. Suhoples, uh, it's your turn. Uh, you have 20 to 30 minutes, and then I hope we will have an intense discussion around your topic. Okay, so, uh, thank you, Professor Weber, for this general and thorough uh, presentation of my modest person, and I would like to jump immediately to, to the point because it is pretty long and complicated. So I want to, sp to speak about four uh, peace treaties made by Soviet Russia with her northwestern neighbors, Estonia, Lithuania, Lat Latvia, and Finland in 1920. These four peace treaties became part of the post-war status quo in Central Europe. Um, uh, among many other questions regulated in the relations between their contracting parties, tr uh, these treaties solved some territorial questions or at least defined borders between Soviet Russia and its four Western neighbors. It was characteristic that the rep respective territorial clauses of these treaties differed from each other in their form and content. This depended in part on the actual territorial problems existing in the relationship of Soviet Russia with its Western neighbors which the peace treaty solves at least temporarily, uh, at least to the outbreak of the Second World War. The moment when each of these peace treaties was signed, as well as the overall situation of each of the four countries striving to reach peace with the Soviets, was also important in the context of territorial arrangements and influenced the form and scope of their treatment in each of these documents. The aim of my speech is to highlight the place territorial questions occupied in peace treaties concluded between Soviet Russia and her four Western neighbors in 1920, 1921, uh, 19, uh, in 1920. 1921, because the whole process was finished with, uh, with, uh, the signature of the Polish Soviet, uh, peace treaty in Riga in March 1921. And, uh, and their importance above for the Soviets and their newly independent partners. In addition, it explains the circumstances and reasons which caused such different territorial, territorial arrangements in these documents. Okay, let's start with Estonia, and I also want to show... Uh, um, okay, uh, so... Uh, 
That's great. We see it. Okay. So, uh, the Estonian Soviet peace treaty was signed in Tartu to the Dorpat on 2nd February 1920. It was the first international treaty concluded by Soviet Russia, which is also noteworthy. Both the Soviets and the Estonians were desperately seeking peace. Through the conclusion of a treaty with Estonia, the Soviet regime wanted to gain two things. Peace in areas situated in Petrograd's direct proximity, the cradle and, ca- uh, and capital of the Bolshevik movement, and makeshift international recognition. The Estonians at the same time wanted to, uh, to both put to an end the war, which had been devastating their country for more than a year to December 1919, and also obtain the Soviet recognition of the Estonian independence. The Soviet Russian government uh, made the first official peace proposals by radio on 31st August 1919, and the first talks between delegations of both countries characterized by deep mutual distrust took place in September in Pskov. Nevertheless, it was only the negotiations initiated in December after the abortive attack of the White Russian Northwestern Army commanded by General Yudenich against Petrograd in Tartu, which led to the conclusion of the peace treaty. One article, number three, and two annexes of the Estonian Soviet peace treaty were dedicated to territorial border questions. Article three described in detail the course of the common border as fixed during negotiations. It also mentioned several technical questions connected with the demarcation of and, uh, of and the creation of some neutralized zones along the frontier. However, negotiations concerning territorial questions were not easy. In this aspect, in this aspect, both delegations put forward proposals which were totally unacceptable to the other side. Initially, in areas situated north of the Lake Pecos, the Estonians wanted to obtain territories stretching to the Luga River. Uh, at the same time, the Soviets, dem- so we are speaking more or less about these areas here, or here is Luga River. And uh, mm, at the same time, oh, sorry. Uh, at the same time, the Soviets demanded lands going as far as the Kunda River and the village of Ranna Pungeria. They also demanded that the Estonians not be allowed to erect any military defensive structures closer than 11 kilometers from the common border. So both sides wanted to get a kind of a buffer zone on the territories which uh, they knew that they cannot gain. It was only after the second and third proposals were put forward, as well as government consultations in Tallinn and Petrograd by heads of both delegations, Jan Poska accompanied by Major, uh, Major General Jan Solz, and Leonid Krasin replaced during these consultations by Adolf Joffe, that agreement regarding the common border could be reached. Therefore, it is possible to say that the eventually agreed border was the result of a compromise which allowed both sides to reach their goals. The Estonians secured for themselves some area situated on the right side of the Narva River, the city of Ivangorod, known to Estonians as Janlin, which became a small buffer zone, improving the security of the city of Narva. So this small area, this small pocket here. Uh, on the other hand, the Soviets were able to secure the border with Estonia relatively distant from the Lugar, Luga River, which from their perspective made the whole area between the Lugar and Narva rivers also a buffer zone improving their security from the southeast and in areas adjacent to Petrograd. Although they gave up the city of Petchori, Petseri, in this section of the border area situated south from Lake Papus, so we are now here, uh, um, this, se- this seemed of less importance to them, because during the negotiations they had agreed quite quickly to draw the border along the existing front line. Sorry, Petchori is here. Uh, one moment, it's here. The 1920 Estonian Soviet peace treaty reappeared in international relations again in 1990s. Then it was necessary to conclude new agreements regulating relations between Estonia and the Russian Federation. So we, we have here a kind of example of a peace treaty made in, after the First World War, which possessed some repercussions even after the Cold War. Uh, the Estonians wished to re- re-establish the border with Russia as agreed in 1920 and changed by the Stalin after the Second World War when Estonia annexed in 1940 and liberated in 1944 was one of the Soviet Union's republics. Because of that change in the north, Estonia lost Yanni, Ivangorod, 
and all territories situated on the right bank of Narva River and in the south, the city of Pachori with areas and pieces of land. Estonian authorities maintained that the Ra Estonian uh, Russian border had already been defined in the peace treaty of 1920. In contrast, the Russian government took a position which questioned the continuous validity of the Tartu Peace Treaty. The Russians stressed that the administrative border between the Estonia, uh, Estonian, Soviet, uh, Estonian Socialist Soviet Republic and the Russian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic had automatically became an international border after restoration of the sovereignty of Estonia in 1991. In other words, the Russians maintained that Estonia was putting forward groundless territorial claims against Russia. Putting aside the political reasons for Russia's actions, in this regard, Russia was trying to present Estonia, but also Latvia, as countries involved in an international dispute, overwhelmed with nationalistic rhetoric against their eastern neighbor. At the end of the day, they wanted to present these two countries uh, as problematic uh, in the face of their potential membership in NATO and European Union. As we know, countries with any uh, border um, problems, border disputes cannot be members of, cannot be accepted as new members of, for example, the European Union. Um, the Russian government based its arguments on the fact that the majority of the inhabitants in the disputed territories were Russians. Their emphasis on the current demographic realities existing in, the, in these areas did not take into consideration that these had been created as a result of Soviet resettlement policies. In 2004, after, after many years of difficult negotiations, the Estonian-Russian border agreement was finally signed. However, the Estonians unilaterally added a preamble to this document, referring in a non-binding way to the 1920 peace treaty. According to the Russian authorities, it made a case for possible territorial dispute, so the Russian side refused to ratify it. Foreign ministers of Estonia and Russia, Urmas Paet and Sergei Lavrov, only uh, concluded the new agreement in 2014, but it has still not been ratified because of tense relations between Estonia and Russia. In 2019, Hen Polwa, speaker of the Estonian parliament, claimed that the agreement might only be ratified if the borderline followed uh, arrangements of 1920 Tartu history. In his New Year's address on 1st January 2021, he said that the Estonian border established by the Tar Tartu Peace Treaty was valid and additionally, uh, and uh, additional complication uh, was caused by this uh, declaration. Therefore, it is now difficult to say what the ultimate outcome of Estonian-Russian negotiations will be and whether one day both sides will agree and ratify a border agreement which will be implemented in practice. Only then will the Estonian-Soviet Tartu Peace Treaty from 2nd February 1920 ultimately rest in peace. Okay, let us go to Lithuania. The um, peace treaty between Lithuania and Soviet Russia was concluded in Moscow on 12 July 1920. The situation of both sides differed substantially from the situation of Estonia and Soviet Russia when they signed the uh, Tartu Peace Treaty in February. Negotiations were commenced on 7th May 1920 after the beginning of the Red Army offensive against Poland, and it was signed when the Soviet offensive gained the moment Polish troops and allied Ukrainian units were quickly retreating westward to avoid encirclement and destruction. The Lithuanian Republic was striving to obtain, as with Estonia and Latvia, the recognition of its independence from uh, the Soviets. The Lithuanians were also seeking the ne neutrality of their newly born state, which was involved in war, wars against the Bolsheviks, the Poles, and previously the Germans also, as well as ensuring a potential ally against, uh, ally against Poland. The government of Lithuania maintained that rather than the Soviets, Poland represented the worst danger for this country. From the Lithuanian perspective, Poland was perceived as an enemy wanting to annex some areas of Lithuania, above all, its historical capital, Vilnius. A full-scale, although undeclared, Polish-Lithuanian war developed in 1920. The Soviets, on the other hand, wanted to both make peace with Lithuania and to make an alliance against Poland. At the beginning of negotiations, they suggested that if Lithuanians would agree to sign a respective military convention, all territorial questions, for example, any Lithuanian, it means any Lithuanian demands in this regard, 
would be solved in a few hours. The Red Army also wanted to use Lithuanian territory during operations against the Polish army in order to help the Bolsheviks to achieve victory. They even promised Lithuania a subsidy amounting to 3 million gold rubles for the free passage of Soviet troops through its territory. Therefore, the agreement signed in, Mos signed in Moscow two days before the Red Army seized Vilnius after Polish troops left, and three days before the city was handed over to Lithuanian authorities, was not only a bilateral peace treaty, but also a kind of an alliance directly against the third country, Poland. Article number two of the treaty determined territorial affairs. The line of the common border was also shown on an annexed map. Four additional remarks, mainly related to technical questions, connected with the limitation of the, uh, of the border. In this map, we in fact see this what the Lithuanians wanted to obtain. This brown color here, this is that what they wanted uh, to obtain from, with the support, maybe in this, this in these words, with the support of the Soviets, and uh, and uh, this orange area was this area which. Uh, the Lithuanians believed uh, uh, they might get from Poland. So, so the treaty with the Soviets was about to secure for them these two zones: this orange one and this brown one. Uh, in other words, the Lithuanians ex expected that the Red Army would overwhelm. Uh, uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, the Soviets uh, expected that the Red Army would overwhelm Latvia and Poland, and these countries would become vassals of the Bolsheviks. And therefore, uh, the frontier line between Lithuania and Poland, as it was written in this uh, Lithuanian-Soviet uh, peace treaty, and between Lithuania and Latvia, will be fixed by arrangements with these states. So these two countries, two contracting parties expected, okay, the war is going on, probably Poland will lose, Latvia will lose, then Lithuania with support or consent of Soviet uh, Russia would be able to make separate peace treaties uh, with Latvia and Poland, which would be advantageous to Lithuania. Then all territorial arrangements would be di dictated by the Soviets and Lithuania could be rewarded for its favorable position towards Soviet Russia. Leaders of Russia and Bolsheviks, above all Lenin, also believed that in case of the general Soviet victory in the West, Lithuania would be also become a state dependent on Soviet Russia or simply another Soviet Republic. In this context, it should be not forgotten that in Lithuanian territories seized by the Red Army, the Bolsheviks immediately began the Sovietization of the local population. The negotiations which uh, paved the way towards the conclusion of the Lithuanian Soviet Treaty were not easy and lasted more than two months. Um, I probably uh, want to skip here uh, these details uh, because the most important thing was that the Moscow Peace Treaty, uh, territorial clauses, as well as all other con uh, constituting the de facto Soviet Lithuanian alliance against both Poland and Latvia, remained in force only for two weeks. So all these details con uh, concerning uh, territorial arrangements between Soviets and Lithuanians were not uh, so important in longer terms. Why it happened? Because, of course, Poland won uh, the Battle of Warsaw and the Soviet march westward was halted and the Red Army re repelled. Poland was also able, through the action of troops commanded by General Zaligowski, to recapture Vilna with adjacent strips of land surrounding the city and connected with other Polish territories. As a result, Lithuania lost connection with Soviet Russia. At the same time, Poland and Latvia gained a common border, the length of which amounted to 113 kilometers. Okay, and so the next one, Latvia. Um, here, in fact, uh, in my opinion, it was the, the least problematic uh, peace treaty, although again, these, these, uh, territorial questions was one of the most problematic questions I discussed during negotiations. 
A month after the conclusion of the Lithuanian Soviet Peace Treaty, Latvia also concluded its peace treaty with Soviet Russia. It was signed at Riga on 11th August 1920. At that time, the situation of Latvia was quite dramatic. Soviet troops were approaching Warsaw, and it could be expected that the Bolsheviks would capture the Polish capital within days. In fact, the decisive battle began just two days after the conclusion of the Latvian Soviet Peace Treaty. But it should not be forgotten that Latvian Soviet negotiations had already begun on 16 April. They lasted almost five months and were conducted in two places, initially in Moscow and only later at the request of the Latvian delegation in Riga. There, the negotiations started effectively on 31st July, after some weeks of break. Negotiations in Moscow began on 16 April 1920. The Soviets wanted to secure the neutrality of Latvia during the war against Poland. Although, on 19th May, Latvia signed the secret commitment that Latvia would remain neutral in the Soviet-Polish conflict. But in reality, this country maintained the benevolent neutrality towards Poland. For its part, the Latvian delegation headed in Moscow by the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Aurelis Zebergs, put forward as the, of most importance the question of the recognition of the Latvia's independence with, within its ethnographic borders. The issue related directly to territorial questions. Negotiations on the common border were complicated and long. They were concluded on, on 9th August 1920 three days before the peace treaty was signed. The course of Latvian Soviet negotiations in, uh, on territorial questions in 1920 is described in detail by the verdict of the Constitutional Court of the Republic of Latvia from 29th November 2007, because we had, again, very similar situation with uh, making the new border treaty after, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the uh, government of, of uh, Latvia uh, wanted to obtain uh, the authorization from the from the uh, constitutional court of the republic to uh, to ratify this new treaty this provide and for historians it is a very good case because the constitutional constitutional court of Latvia collected all possible documents regarding these negotiations from 1920 so it was really very easy to find materials uh, regarding uh, making a treaty in 1920 between a uh, newly born Latvian Republic and Soviet Russia. Uh, this provides explanations on compliance with the law on the authorization to the cabinet of ministers to sign an agreement between Latvia and Russia on the state border initial, initialed on August 7, 1997. As transcripts of relevant documents collected by the Latvian Constitutional Court in 2007 show, in 1920, Latvia wished to extend its sovereignty on parts of the territor territories in several border districts. It also wanted to control several railway junctions situated in border territories. Especially important was the question of the possession of a small border railway station, Pitalova, Pitalovo in, in Russian, this is this station, which is just here. Uh, it was an important junction of railway lines going through Latvian territory, but also connecting Latvia with Russia. The head of the Soviet delegation in 1920, uh, Adolf Joffe, stated that Latvian claims for the parts of four or border districts, Ostrova, Opochka, Sebieża, and Drisa, resulted not from ethnographic considerations, since the Latvians were in the minority in these areas, but from strategic objectives and aggressive plans designed by the Latvian government against Soviet Russia. So here we have this element of fear uh, as presented by Soviet Russian authorities. But we, I will return to this question at the very end of my of my speech. Therefore, the Latvians agreed that the border with Opochka and Sebieża districts should run along the Ludza River up to the Pitele Lake as the Soviet Russia wanted, and not along the Zeplinga River at the, as the lit Latvians initially won. On the other hand, the Soviet delegation made concessions regarding the issue of the Ostrovo district. On April 27, the Soviet delegation agreed to make concessions to Latvian economic claims regarding the Pitalovo railway junction. And in fact, it was the most important question, this small railway station. 
uh, which, as Joffe declared, was the region inhabited by non-Latvians, just like the other disputed uh, districts. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, he admitted that if Latvia did not possess Petalovo in 1920, it was remained as Jaundlat Dalla and in 1938 as Abrene, it would create a serious problem for this country as railway, railway traffic between separate parts of Latvia would be impossible without the construction of new lines. In other words, he maintained that handling over Petalovo to, to Latvia was a Soviet-Russian goodwill gesture. Uh, the agreement on the common Latvian-Russian border reached during negotiations in Moscow and Riga was reflected in the final peace treaty. As in the cases of the Estonian Soviet uh, and Lithuanian Soviet peace treaties, one article, article again number three, and three additional technical notes directly con concerned border uh, uh, arrangements. Interestingly, this uh, confirmed the exceptional character of the Lithuanian Soviet uh, peace treaty. The Latvian Soviet peace treaty did not refer to any future possible agreements between any uh, Latvian neighbors. The Latvian Soviet Riga Peace Treaty, the same as in the case of the Estonian Soviet Peace Treaty, reappeared at the turn of 20 and 21 centuries, exactly because of the same reasons like in the case of uh, Estonian, uh, new Estonian uh, Russian um, border treaty. Uh, between 1993 and uh, 2005, Latvia and Russia negotiated the matter of a new border treaty. Finally, Latvia agreed to drop its claims to Abrene, to Pitavo. Because in May 2005, Russia refused to sign a border treaty when the Latvian government wanted to attach a declaration referring to the 1920 Latvian Soviet Peace Treaty, under which Abrene belongs to Latvia. In the same year, the Latvian government authorized Prime Minister Aigars Talvitis to sign the treaty, uh, thus annulling the declaration. In 2007, the Constitutional Court of Latvia, in the already mentioned verdict, authorized the Latvian government exchange ratification documents. So, we under, in other words, in our times, the Latvians adopted a little other um, position towards uh, Russia. Okay, let us forget about the treaty from 1920. Let us make the new treaty. It will be fine. Uh, there is no need to, to make uh, constantly these uh, historical references. And the Estonians still want to, to stress that uh, the treaty from 1920 is an important uh, cornerstone of their independence and therefore they cannot omit uh, referring to it also in this new treaty, possibly, possibly ratified one day uh, treaty with, with, uh, with Russia. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, today, uh, 1920 Riga Peace Treaty between Latvia and uh, Soviet Russia sh is no, no longer uh, treated as a reference point in bilateral Latvian-Russian relations, and its political meaning remained more symbolic. The question of the international recognition of Latvia as well as the constitution uh, continuation of the Latvian statehood than practical. For, for Estonians, this meaning is very different. It's much more practical today. And the last treaty which I want to discuss with Finland, which is a very different treaty in fact. Although some authors maintain that the 1920 Finnish uh, Soviet Tartu uh, peace treaty signed on 14 October was similar to peace treaties signed by Baltic republics and the Soviets, it was in fact quite different in many aspects, including its territorial clauses. It should be stated in this context that Soviet Russia had already recognized the independence of Finland on 18 December, 31st December, New Style 1917, when a delegation headed by the chairman of the Finnish government, Per Evin Svinhufut, came to Petrograd and visited Vladimir Lenin. Then the Soviet government issued a decree recognizing Finland's independence. On 22nd December, 4 January uh, 1918, New Style, the decree was approved by the All Russian Central Executive Committee. This fact is explicitly mentioned in the preamble of the 1920 Tartu Peace Treaty. In other words, the 1920 Dorpat Peace, uh, Tartu Peace Treaty only confirmed the existing state of affairs, uh, which means that Soviet Russia already recognized the independence of Finland and uh, at the turn of 1917 and 1918. Regarding the establishment of the border between Finland and Russia, two important facts are worth, worth mentioning. Finland possessed a clearly defined border with Russia. 
firstly as a part of Sweden and later as an autonomous grand duchy connected with Russia by bonds of personal union from 1809. The eastern border of Finland was ultimately established in 18, uh, after some rectifications uh, in 1812. Besides, it should be remembered that on 1st March 1918, a treaty between the Russian and Finnish socialist republics was concluded. The Finnish Reds, Reds who were ultimately defeated by troops of the Finnish Whites, um, the army of the legal Finnish government during the Finnish civil war. So the, the Finnish Reds also made a separate treaty with, with uh, Soviet Russia. According to paragraph 14 of this document, Soviet Russia handed to Finland the territory of uh, Pechenga, Petsamo, situated on the coast of the Arctic Ocean. Therefore, it is possible to say that the Russian Bolsheviks agreed to fulfill Tsar Alexander II's 1864 commitment when he promised to attach Pechenga to the territory of the Grand Duchy of Finland. This was in exchange for a small city of Sisterbeck Sestroyers on the outskirts of St. Petersburg, which had a munitions factory there. Nevertheless, when Red Finland collapsed, the Soviets refused to give up Pechenga. Only when Finnish authorities dropped their claims to the two border Karelian uh, Karelian uh, parishes, Repola and Por uh, Poraya, just here, which is in the middle of nowhere. Uh, during the Tartu peace negotiations, did the Soviet government agree to transfer the disputed northern territory? Uh, however, the Soviets guaranteed the national right of self-determination to the population of both disputed parishes. Both questions found confirmation in the 1920 Tartu peace. Articles 4 and 10. In addition to Finnish Soviet history, it clearly defined several other questions which limited Finland's sovereignty to certain territories of strategic importance. It um, related especially to uh, military rights, uh, to some uh, islands in, uh, in the Gulf of Finland, and, uh, and um, uh, Finland agreed to, to not to militarize some of them. I am not speaking here about Holland Islands, which was a very different problem, and uh, I am not speaking about it here because it was not touched by the treaty between Finland and, and uh, Soviet Russia. Um, finally, Article 16 stated the de facto neutralization of the Lake Ladoga and its coast on both sides of the common border, because we must remember that at that time Finland, in fact, possessed a half of the Lake. Uh, um, besides uh, five declarations issued by both uh, were issued by both delegations on the day when it was uh, when the treaty was signed, and it supplemented the treaty. Four were uh, were uh, were uh, issued by the Soviets and one by the Finnish government, and they um, re regarded uh, they related to to some. Details concerning concerning the rights of uh, population in 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 national rights of population in disputed border areas in Ingria in Karelia etc. Um, I think that I also will present few conclusions. Um, summing up, summing up. Uh, my considerations about all these four peace treaties. So the peace treaties uh, concluded in 1920 by Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia and Finland with Soviet Russia regarding territorial questions could be divided into three groups. The first one consists of two treaties concluded by Estonia and Latvia with the Soviets. Although these treaties limited territorial questions to the definition of state borders, borders it uh, seemed during the respective negotiations that territorial questions were the most difficult. In the case of the 1920 Estonian Soviet Peace Treaty, it is possible to say that it uh, was the fruit of some compromise. It meant that the agreed border was drawn a few kilometers eastwards from the Narva River, which created a buffer zone in the northern sector, and ran through the Pskovskoye Azero, and uh, further leaving the city of uh, Pechori with adjacent territory on the Estonian side of the border. At the same time, areas on both banks of the Ruga River in the northern sectors of the common border state in Russia. The strategic considerations of both negotiating sides were at the center of the uh, attention. 
and the ultimate result of the peace talks regarding territorial questions appears to be acceptable for them, mainly from the military point of view. And it was the main, in my opinion, the main um, difference when we compare it with the Latvian peace treaty, because uh, at the end of the day, the Latvian peace treaty, uh, when we speak about territorial questions, uh, um, concerned more economic questions. These railway junctions, especially this one which was given by the Soviets to, to, uh, to Latvia. Uh, so these two treaties are very similar to each other, but in the center of territorial, uh, consideration, territorial questions. In case of Estonia, it was military consideration, strategic thinking about the future. And in case of Latvia, rather economic efforts. Um, it is necessary to look differently at the 1920 Lithuanian Soviet, Lithuanian Soviet Moscow Peace Treaty. It was a singular treaty, not only because of the place where it was signed, and not only because it created a de facto alliance between both con uh, contracting countries, directed first of all against Poland. The question of territorial arrangements between Lithuania and Soviet Russia, as described in this peace treaty, was also unique. The delimitation of the common border was similar to delimitations of the borders in the peace treaties between Soviet Russia and two other uh, Baltic republics. However, the delimitation of the uh, Soviet-Lithuanian border in the Moscow peace treaty was unusual. Lithuanian territorial claims could be fulfilled only if the Soviet offensive against Poland was successful and if both countries, after Poland's defeat, could also secure the existence of the common Soviet-Lithuanian border. In addition, this treaty explicitly presumed that the borders of Lithuania with Poland and Latvia would be agreed in separate bilateral treaties. Uh, and of course, when, when Poland won the war against the Soviets, uh, it at the same time made the treaty between Lithuania and, and uh, Soviet Russia move and void. And finally, the Finnish Soviet uh, Tartu peace, uh, peace Treaty was also different because, in fact, it confirmed an already existing situation with some rectifications of border, I mean, these two parishes, the Poland, Por, uh, Porayerti, and in the north, the Pechanga Petsam territory. And later, this treaty was uh, also, uh, uh, I mean, both countries had to make another treaty in 1922 after the uprising, Finnish uprising in Eastern Karelia, uh, because the Soviets did not, uh, wanted to observe any, any stipulations, uh, regarding, the um, rights of, uh, Finnish speaking, uh, inhabitants of Eastern Karelia. So, uh, after two, in fact, uprisings, uh, which were suppressed at the end of the day by the Soviets, the new treaty, uh, was, uh, was uh, signed in 1st in June 1922 in Helsinki uh, when Finland and Soviet Russia signed an agreement between Soviet Russia and Finland about the measures providing the inviolability of the Soviet-Finnish border. The Finnish-Soviet border remained intact from that moment until the outbreak of the Second World War and uh, until the outbreak of the Winter War. And uh, I also want to add that uh, the conclusion of my speech that I also don't want to say that the Finns had no aims regarding regarding Eastern Karelia in 1919, 1920, 1921. The problem of uh, relations with Soviet Russia was really complicated and uh, not so, I would say, unilateral as it could seem at the first glance, but it probably belonged to another topic and another conference or speech. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Suhoples, for this uh, very clear and uh, synthetical uh, presentation of the whole complex of uh, young USSR's uh, border uh, issues with its neighbors. Um, I open the floor for discussion before if I, possibly I add my, my own question, but first of all, uh, to our uh, panelists and also to the audience, of course. Uh, yes. Hello, sir. Okay. Thank, thank you. I'm uh, sorry. My name is Akansha, and I'm uh, from India. 
and uh, thank you for your very interesting presentation sir actually uh, you quite clearly spoke about all these peace treaties between soviet union and baltic states i was just wondering if you could throw some light on the current status of these treaties presently how is the situation between uh, the russia and uh, these three baltic states especially estonia and latvia uh, i'm talking about the current status of these uh, border treaties because uh, see from indian perspective from the third perspective i'm uh, like uh, i have this uh, very vague uh, kind of uh, uh, generalization like i do I, because there is limitation of uh, resources and especially from our uh, side of the world it is kind of very difficult to know what is the what is the hesitation from russia as well as uh, from these uh, countries uh when it comes to the border whether these countries they are kind of having this fear from russia not ideologically and not in a military terms but when it comes to the border especially when we talk about latvia so i was just uh, in your opinion uh, i would just want you to know that and also if you could somehow throw some light on the current status of these treaties Uh, okay so hey so, directly maybe uh, then we will have uh, two questions on the chat so maybe first you uh, could answer okay this. so thank you very much for your question and in fact you allow me also to return to the question of fear because uh, you know i was just trying to deconstruct the psychological situation then in 1920 and also now so If you are a leader of Soviet Russia, you could maintain this. Huh. Finally, we recognize their independence. So from our perspective, the very fact that we agreed for the independence of these four countries, especially three, Latvia, Estonia, and Finland, is a territorial concession as such. So why they still want from us some stupid parish or three kilometers of a buffer zone or something like this? So we see here two psychological situations for these countries. These three kilometers left of or right, sometimes it was very very important because of economic reasons, because of uh, strategic considerations, because of, uh, for example, uh, the question of. Uh, uh joining some territory with uh native native finnish speakers something like this yes for russia it was less important in this regard but i think that they also i mean the soviets or rather i would i would better use the word the russians would not understand one thing if we agree for their independence what else they want from us and in fact in in some sense but only in some sense the situation repeated uh, after the collapse of the soviet union because these two countries i mean latvia and estonia wanted to refer directly to peace treaties made in 1920 uh, after these uh, border rectifications made already after the second world war and uh, russia uh, side uh, used it uh, against them but it is it was also some psychological problem related again to this what i said earlier why to hell they want from us still these two or three kilometers this is such a detail yes but of course no country will give over any territory even 10 centimeters not just three three or five kilometers but at the same time it immediately was used as a tool in some broader political context against especially Estonia but also Latvia the Estonians still are not able to come to terms with Russia because of their huh, because of their old fears and Latvians it, it seems to me that they they came to terms firstly with themselves when they said to Russians okay let us forget about the treaty from 1920 and uh, its meaning is mainly symbolic and not practical for estonians it's still more practical than symbolic. so if i if i am able to answer your question in such way thank you thank you sir it was very clear thank you 
Okay, so I uh, would uh, try to sum up. We have uh, on uh, the chat, you can see, we have uh, three questions, uh, two bunch of questions. The first one is about an internal factor or a transnational factor too, in fact, uh, the position, the possible role of Baltic Germans in the negotiations um, and uh, in uh, in the, 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 the process of, of the sign of this treaty is that the first uh, question, uh, the same person asked uh, another question about uh, the event, the, the role of Norway, yeah, the role of Norway in the treaty between Finland and Soviets. Was it, was there a role? What was this role? Can you have uh, some um, some some answers to this question? And the, right. Uh, there is another question about external factors, which concerns the great powers and Poland. Great powers, Great Britain and France, and Poland towards the de jure uh, recognition of the Baltic states and their admission to the League of Nations at so, the so. end of 1920-21. Uh, okay, about uh, Baltic Germans. I would say that Baltic Germans played no role in this, in this uh, process. Because uh, we must remember what was the situation in 1918, 1919, 1920. German Baltics were associated also psychologically, but also practically, with German forces which uh, which uh, were present in these territories, and they were in fact fighting against the independence of this country. So I would say that the German Balts played no role. In this, in this, uh, in making the, of the peace between Estonia or Latvia with uh, with Soviet uh, Soviet Russia. And the second question, uh, the second one is about uh, the role uh, of Norway. Ah, okay. Was... So uh, this is this is a, a tricky question because uh, at the first glance, it is uh, the easiest way to answer this question is Norway played no role. But Norway had also owned a small uh, border dispute with Finland. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we can see the problem in two dimensions. The first dimension is that uh, Norway, in fact, was uh, happy, but also unhappy that, they, that it can lose the border with, with Russia for, uh, because of the rights of, uh, for example, uh, Norwegian fishers who were fishing in uh, Arctic Ocean and uh, uh, the new body, Finland, could be a little bit problematic. But in fact, Norway played no role, uh, no political role in this process, in the process of making making uh, peace uh, between Finland and um, uh, Soviet Russia. And why? Because all these Nordic or Scandinavian kingdoms wanted to stay away from any conflicts uh, from uh, resulting from the First World War. They still wanted to keep their neutrality. Um, so I would say that uh, Norway was carefully observing what is going on, but she played no uh, active role in in the process of making the peace. And uh, the last question about... The great powers, the great powers and Poland, okay? Uh, so, uh, uh, concerning the admission of the Baltic States, the de jure recognition and admission to the League of Nations at the turn of 2021, if you had some... Uh, I would say that uh, great powers adopted a typical policy on, of wait and see. So, and it was the reason why Estonia, why also Finland in, already in 1917, after the declaration of Finnish independence, also Latvia later, also Lithuania, wanted so ardently to make this peace treaty with the Soviet, with Soviet Russia. Why? Because, as in the case of Finland, let us obtain the recognition from whatever Russia. If we have a recognition of our independence from whatever Russia, then we have an argument in our talks, negoci negotiations with the West about our recognition. And only after the situation was totally clarified by a series of peace treaties, I mean, with Finland, with Lithuania, with Estonia, Latvia, but also with Poland, only then 
uh, Western great powers decided to uh, recognize the euro, de facto, and the euro, first of all, the euro, these new countries. And it happened only in 1921. And it was not the matter of incident that they were recognized only in 1921. For Poland, the situation of Poland was, you know, uh, more complicated, of course, because we needed, I mean, Poland needed allies for their struggle for survival with the Soviets. So, of course, uh, uh, what we have, I, I, I uh, would advise to read a book of Marco Lechti, who described in detail all Baltic conferences. Uh, I think that this is the only book which which uh, describe uh, describes these conferences in such detail. Uh, Marco Lechti, a historian from the University of Tampere, from Tampere Peace Research Institute. And uh, we see that, of course, uh, our Polish uh, diplomats were active in all uh, these new countries already in 1919. But it was, uh, of course, the matter of our political and uh, strategical needs. So Poland, of course, wanted to, uh, Pol Poland recognized at least de facto, uh, the independence of this, these countries earlier than, uh, Western great powers. But it was a result of the war situation in the East, general war situation in the East. And this is my answer to this question. Thank you very much. And uh, a question by another panelist, uh, German Ragozin, uh, on the chat. Uh, Ragozin chose the chat option. This, uh, of course, is possible. Uh, it's a question that is interesting also from the perspective of our, uh, one of the last presentations on Saturday by uh, Dr. Akanksha Singh about the Russian minority. Uh, what was the perception of the Russian minorities in all four independent states after the mutation? And how did it impact on the border fear in these states? But, uh, Mr. Ragozin, you are asking about 1920 or 1991 and, uh. I think it's about 1920, if I, if I may. Uh, I just say that it, it is, a, it echoes in the presentation we will have, uh, uh, the day after tomorrow. But I think the question concerns, uh, the same, uh, uh, period of time, uh, as uh, in your presentation, if I may. Uh, it's really difficult to, to answer uh, to me this question because I was not making research in the question of uh, minorities, especially Russian minorities in uh, these territories. I only can say a little bit about, uh, about the situation on uh, the Finnish um, Russian border, but the situation there was also unique because, in fact, Finland was uh, possessed border with uh, ter Russian territories with Finnish speaking minorities so so it was really uh, difficult to for me to to say what was going on with purely Russian minority in this territory because I am I am just wondering if there was really purely Russian minority it was much more complicated. Uh, these people sometimes were, were recognized as the Finns, especially in the period of early 1920s, when uh, some nationalistic circles in Finland developed the idea of greater Finland. But on the other hand, I would say that in Finland, especially in early 1920s, against much later developed stereotypes, there was nothing like hate towards Russia. This was uh, orchestrated much later, and it was also not very popular in, in Finland. Only the Second World War uh, instigated truly anti-Russian sentiments, but it is also very complicated and not uh, easy to answer in five minutes question. So, uh, something like Rissebiha. So this hate towards Russia in Finland, uh, in Finland, yes, in, uh, interwar period, it was very limited, almost non-existent. In fact, it was sometime used by these, uh, such organizations yeah, like AKS, IKL, just to, uh, provide the reason for their own existence, that they must defend Finland against potential uh, Russian 
barbarism, something like this. And I can, I can, I can give you a very good, uh, very good essay of Professor Klinger about this. Um, he published it in one of, of, of his books. So it was also a kind of surprise to me because, 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 uh, I thought that this uh, idea of anti-Russian sentiments in such countries like uh, Finland had to be much deeper rooted than only the Second World War. Thank you. Thank you. I see a last question or comment by Professor Margit Busman. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Professor Zorobl. This was really, really interesting, and I sort of was... Um, Interested to hear your thoughts about um, your conclusion that for Estonia there were more military considerations, maybe that uh, played a role, and for Latvia more economic considerations that played a role. If I may, I I think that all these countries lived all their independent years in a deep fear against Russia. I mean, military. Mm -hmm. Fear. Of course, I don't disagree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when we when we concentrate just on the content of treaties, mm -hmm. we we can see that in uh, Estonian peace treaty, the, these military strategic considerations, I mean, these buffer zones, five kilometers left, five kilometers mm -hmm. uh, right, were more important than in Latvia. For the Latvians, in some moment, they understood that during negotiations, okay, the Russians will will not give us this what we want. So we, what we, what we can obtain, we can obtain just this one railway junction. It is important for our economy. I hope you understand. Me. Yeah, yeah. No, it, I mean, this is really interesting because, but maybe we, I mean, I don't want to take up too much time, but maybe we can discuss that more than on Saturday in the concluding session, because that makes sort of sense also maybe with the, the time now. You know, with uh, not in the history, but in time now that because we will, when we talk about our presentation on airspace violations, we see many more today, we see many more violations of Estonian airspace, which has to mm -hmm. do, of course, with the St. Petersburg. Um, but, uh, but you know, here we also, we start to touch a little different problem. Yeah. Problem of the problem of the Russian military doctrine in the basin of the Baltic Sea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also must remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the way, I should, very, in in very short time, I should write another paper just about fi what role played Finland in the Russian military doctrine in 19 and 20. And of course, as a po point of reference, I immediately think about Estonia. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Estonia and Latvia are a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a dilemma, not a security dilemma, uh, but a, a time the dilemma. The security of conference. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, I, I just, uh, as uh, they say it in German, sometimes I put it in the room uh, as a, a comment or a, a question for later, maybe, because I, I would not like to, to uh, have uh, Professor uh, uh, Hackman wait with his uh, additional presentation for all our uh, panelists. Uh, about uh, our conference center in Kulice to close the first day. But still, uh, one point that may be important, and we can go back to this maybe through other uh, presentations in the final, con uh, con uh, in the concluding uh, uh, session, uh, were there, uh, you know, kind of triads or coalitions, or did some of the small actors try to work together to obtain more or obtain anything uh, possible from Russia? Uh, not uh, necessarily the three ones together, maybe Estonia and Finland or Latvia and Litu Lithuania, for example. Uh, we know that in, in this kind of constellations, uh, at least uh, since uh, Theodore Kaplow's uh, famous book, uh, Three Against One, Triads, uh, that this uh, scheme is, is often present, especially in negotiations. So, uh, well, I I'm not sure uh, whether you, you would like to answer right now or if you want just to to, to, to take note of it for, for later, but uh, it's no, if you give me one minute, I will do it. I will do it now. We must remember that in 1919, 1920, 1921, 22, 23, these countries, including Poland, they they tried different kind of constellations. Estonia was trying to make a union with Finland. Finland refused. Poland was trying to make uh, this uh, alliance 
uh, which was uh, expressed in so-called the Warsaw Accord in 1922. Uh, and 22 or 23. Oh my God. I forgot. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it, w- it could not happen because, because, uh, Finland refused to ratify and without Lithuania, which was in conflict uh, with, uh, with Poland against, uh, on, on uh, Vilnius, um, uh, it was impossible. And Finland was trying different constellations. Uh, the Finns were constantly thinking, huh? We are the northernmost part of the Central Europe, or we are, or we should be a part of Scandinavia. Scandinavia in 1920s told them, no, 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 we, we don't want you because if we accept that you are Scandinavian, another Scandinavian neutral country, we might be placed in a conflict with Russia. So the Finns waited until 1935 and they again, they declared we want to be Scandinavian. And next, for next, uh, at least 40 years or even, even longer, they tried to convince everybody that they are Scandinavians. But in the recent years, in 2015, when uh, Russia started to send, uh, refugees on bikes to Finland, uh, the Finns came to the conclusion, huh, our policy of, of, uh, of, uh, neutrality of, uh, Scandinavian orientation is, uh, also doubtful because in fact, when uh, somebody in Moscow will do like this, we are back in Central Europe. So all we we can find many uh, many uh, constellations. Also, the, uh, the Baltic Alliance in 1934, when Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia signed uh, an alliance, a treaty. But the problem is that the fear ordered all these countries to find allies, but they also remember who is a potential enemy. And even in whatever combination, they always come to the final conclusion, we are too weak. So we must find some other uh, solution. And it seems to me that at the moment, NATO offers some kind of of uh, solution, but, we, but uh, if the moment of the truth would come. I hope it will never come. Uh, these countries also know that even with the support of NATO, they have no chance in any open conflict. Why finally Estonia is digitalizing all spheres of life and they are moving servers to Luxembourg? Because they know that they are unable to defend its own territory, even with support of the United States. Okay. Thank you very much also for this perspective on, on uh, nowadays. Uh, well, uh, part of the the, the, this, uh, the questions, the issues we had during discussion for sure will uh, come back to us uh, through uh, the several panels we have uh, still uh, tomorrow and uh, the day after tomorrow. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Suchopless, for this presentation. Thank and you very much to, for the opportunity. Of course, and uh, thanks to be present uh, with us uh, during all this conference. Um, for uh, now, it is the end of the um, conference part.